the smoke is thick enough to choke, and I find myself too caught up in a coughing fit to hear the landing craft operator call out 30 seconds to the beach. Overhead, American and British aircraft scream through the sky, strafing a line of hardened concrete bunkers. High explosive shells from the assault support group's big battleships and destroyers smash into the beach and the bunkers both. A stretch of the French coast several miles long has been turned into hell on earth. Fire, smoke, and the screams of dying men fill the air. The landing crafts belch out thick plumes of smoke, ideally obscuring the views of German gunners up on the higher slopes of the beach. Unfortunately, the prevailing wind is blowing most of the smoke back out to sea, and I'm pretty sure all it's doing is making it hard to breathe for any of us streaming toward the shore. I can't tell how far out we are. I don't dare peek my head up above the steel-armored sides of my landing craft, and instead keep my gaze down. Typically, LCVPs had sides made of nothing more than reinforced wood paneling, but with the heavy opposition the first few waves would face, our landing craft enjoyed the luxury of an inch of armor plating. I don't miss the second call from the operator calling out 15 seconds to the beach, but I still keep my head down. I won't so much as look up until I feel the craft smash into the beach and hear the ramp splash down. I try to ignore the swill of vomit and seawater swishing past my ankles at the bottom of the boat. Damn thing tosses up and down on each wave, and half the men are seasick. The other half puked out of fear and nerves. Suddenly, the metallic pinging sound of high-caliber rounds finding their mark rings out all across the boat. We all dock even lower inside the boat, but some of the men are too late, and the German gunner's position is too high. Blood and other bodily fluids quickly join the vomit-laced seawater at the bottom of the boat. And then, the entire craft comes to a sudden stop. Half of us get pitched forward and down into that disgusting water. A second later, there's the distinct sound of the 200-pound ramp at the front hitting the ground. For a moment, I can't believe it. There's no protection from that machine gun fire anymore, and we're supposed to just walk out into it? What kind of madness is this? But it doesn't matter because staying on the boat is guaranteed to get you killed. Terror pumps through my veins as I scramble up onto my feet and push forward. Several of the men in front of me slump backwards, and I find myself screaming and cursing at them, demanding that they move already, dammit. Then I realize that they're dead. I'd be dead too if they hadn't been standing right in front of me and shielded me with their bodies. There's no time to mourn, no time for shock. I shove the corpses out of my way and half crawl over them. I step on one of the dead men's faces in my scramble to get out of the boat, shattering the glasses he still wears. I think his name was Lewis one of the older guys in our platoon. Home was somewhere in upstate New York, just outside the city. He'd volunteered before he got his draft notice, and now he was a corpse at the bottom of a landing craft with shattered glasses and a broken nose from me climbing over him in my mad dash to safety. Men drop all around me as I stumble out of the landing craft at last. I run forward at a mad dash, then realize what I'm doing and hit the deck. A large iron tank obstacle, Czech Hedgehog as they're known in Eastern Europe, it's only a few feet in front of me. It's not much cover, but it's better than nothing, and I start crawling. Some German gunner in a pillbox in front of me and above me must have spied my plan because the moment I start crawling, he opens up all around me. I make it to the hedgehog though and take what little cover I can get behind that twisted metal. Thankfully, I'm just under the German's firing angle and he can't quite get at me. Explodes from the machine gun fire though, and high speed sand blasts my body like shrapnel stinging and cutting the exposed flesh on my face, neck, and hands. Then, I hear a whooshing sound followed by a dull thump, and the firing stops. I peer up cautiously and see the pillbox in flames, and off to my right a man prepares to reload his bazooka and have a go at another German position. He never gets a chance to. A sniper's bullet catches him right in the sternum and he drops. I could see bloody bubbles erupting from the man's mouth and gasps for air like fish on dry land. And I know he's probably already dead. There's nothing anyone could do for him. Still, I'm grateful for him. I'd probably be dead without his expert shot. It's another few long moments before I realize that I'm supposed to be doing something. I'm not supposed to be just sitting here, huddled behind this tank obstacle and watching the world go to hell all around me. I'm supposed to be charging up that beach, taking the same bunkers spitting death at hundreds of rounds per minute. For the second time, in just a few short minutes, it strikes me just how utterly insane this all is. Just charge up the beach into the teeth of German machine guns and take them out. Who came up with this plan? And who was insane enough to go through with it? I hear loud whistling that tears me out of my day's trance. A fresh wave of landing craft have hit the shore and more men are swarming up along the beach. A large black army sergeant is blowing a whistle as he charges up the beach toward me. He doesn't even stop as he picks me up by my uniform and drags me forward with him. Come on, you son of a bitch, there ain't no Germans to kill down here. I'm staggering, trying to catch my balance, half dragged by the muscle-bound sergeant and half stumbling forward on my own power. 
Finally, he shoves me down as he himself takes cover behind a sand dune. The sergeant scans the beach behind him, taking in the corpses washing up from the burning landing craft a hundred feet off the shore, as well as the dead men whose boats actually made it to the beach. Most only took a single step onto the French soil before buying the farm. I look around too, corpses behind us, survivors huddling at the base of the first line of German defenses. I can't help but note that there's a lot more of us dead than alive. The sergeant looks angry? No, frustrated, as if this whole affair was nothing more than some great inconvenience rather than a literal bloodbath. He calls out to groups of men huddled under tank tarps, behind sand dunes and other pieces of cover from the fierce German fire. I can't help but think that back home most of these white soldiers wouldn't have paid half a mind to that black sergeant. But here, well, we all bleed red, as had been made abundantly clear. I think the men are just glad to have someone to follow. I'll admit it, as the sergeant barks out orders in preparation for our assault, even I'm relieved. Someone with a plan in all this chaos. The sergeant's confidence is contagious. Alright you dogs, Europe ain't gonna save itself. The men actually manage a battle cry as they join the sergeant in the assault. I'm astonished to hear myself join in the chorus of voices. Even more incredulous to be picking myself up from behind the safety of a thick sand dune and rushing forward into a horizontal rain of shrapnel and high velocity lead. There's nothing to do but run. Run as fast as you can and get under the line of fire of the German gunners. The same bunkers that keep them safe from bombardment and gunfire will be our safety as well once we get to their bottom walls. There's machine gun pillboxes between us and the first line of concrete bunkers, but thankfully most of them have been completely devastated by our preparatory bombardments and airstrikes. The few that haven't been score massive casualties on our forces, but there's more troops hitting the shore every minute and the Germans are eventually overwhelmed. Some simply run out of ammo, killing dozens before being swarmed by men swinging bayonets and rifle butts. Somehow, the sight of Germans being beaten and stabbed to death is more terrible to me than any of the countless poor saps I've seen getting cut down by those same machine gunners. There's something modern about a machine gun, almost civilized, at least compared to the primordial screams and yells as men tear the Germans to pieces with their bare hands. I don't even realize that we've hit a minefield until I've managed to run at least a hundred yards in. The roar of machine guns and explosions all around me merges into a hellish cacophony of chaos, and I'm not even aware of the mines until I catch sight of a man far to my left as he suddenly cut down from below. Despite my system being flooded with terror-fueled adrenaline, I feel a new shiver of fear race up my spine for an instant, knowing every step could be my last. The sergeant I've been following this entire time looks over his shoulder at me, a knowing look on his face. He doesn't have to say it aloud. The only way out is forward. I run, pumping my legs as hard as I can and fighting against the damn sand for speed. There's even fewer of us than before when we finally hit the bottom of the German bunker, and most of us collapse, gasping for breath. I'm shocked to realize that we're only barely 200 yards from the breaking waves. I could swear I just ran halfway across France. The sergeant's on us again immediately though, picking men up to their feet by force if necessary. The man is a machine, and I hate to say it, but he's right. There's no time to rest, especially not directly under a heavily fortified German position. Their machine guns may not be able to get us, but at that moment several grenades explode along our line. I can hear the distinct sound of more hitting the ground all around us as I dive for cover. We're directly under a firing slit, and the crowds inside are just tossing grenades onto us from above. We're worse than sitting ducks. I don't know how many grenades kill or injure, all I know is that other than cuts and bruises all my limbs are intact and I'm alive. I also know that we can't stay here. I shove a man next to me forward and find myself screaming at him and several others. Move your asses, damn it! We have to keep going. We gotta work our way out to the rear of the bunkers and start clearing them out. The Germans have built their bunkers so that one could support the other, but they weren't planning on the overwhelming numbers of landing craft they've been dealing with today. A massive human wave is breaking on those French shores and staining them red with unthinkable amounts of blood. We quickly move around the bunker, the men in front of me gunning down two Germans rushing toward the same entrance we're moving to. They were loaded down with machine gun belts, no doubt there to resupply the defenders. With the sound of gunfire behind their position, the crowds inside would no doubt know we were coming. But we wouldn't have to charge in there ourselves and straight into the waiting rifles and machine guns of the Germans. First, we had a treat for them. The thought of burning another human alive is deeply horrendous to me, but I'm ashamed to admit that I'm glad to see one of the flamethrower equipped men manage to make it up the beach. The thought of running into this barrage of high speed lead with an explosive tank on your back is utterly insane, 
but now I'm glad that some SOB was brave or stupid enough to do it. The flamethrower makes a horrible swishing sound as it fills the bunker with fire. In the tight confines, the flames reach into every corner, and the air in the bunker heats up so hot that men's skin and clothes burst into flames even if they manage to avoid a direct blast. I can hear the horrible screams of dying men over the sound of machine gun rounds cooking off, and as the stench of burning human flesh reaches me, I find myself retching for the second time this morning. I feel a firm grip on my shoulder and look up into the face of the black sergeant, giving me a slight nod. The man looks grim, but determined. I can't help but admire him and his steely resolve. He nods at me and the other survivors, 18 of us out of at least 100 that made it off the first wave of boats. Take a breather, wait for more men to make it up the beach and we'll hit the second line of bunkers. I look behind me and down at the beach there's dead and dying everywhere. But scrambling for safety are dozens of soldiers. Often they have to crawl over corpses to find a bit of safety in the hailstorm of bullets that greets them. But the firing is less severe now. More men are making it up to the beach alive than before. Glancing down at the watch on my wrist, my eyes widen in amazement. It's only been 13 minutes since the assault began. Here in this brief respite from the storm, it already feels like a lifetime ago. It's then that I realize that I haven't even fired my rifle once yet. Now check out how I survived combat, or click this other video instead.